Welcome to the webinar for the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust. Uh, see, we've got rising 90 of, of you joining us already. Uh, we'll do the usual trick that we do on these webinars. We'll uh, wait for five minutes just to let everybody get on board. And we aim to start at five past three. Um, for those of you who've been with us before, you'll know all about the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, the plan is that uh, Paul will deliver his talk and we will take questions at the end of the talk. Um, so if you, during the talk, uh, if you've got any questions, if you use the Q&A button on the bottom bar of your screen, type them in and then we'll pick them up at the end. Um, hopefully we can give you an answer. I'm absolutely certain that Paul can give you an answer. Uh, we'll be there. So at the moment we've got 118 of you with us. Um, we're expecting a few more. And uh, we hope that uh, you will enjoy a nice talk this afternoon. Um, where I am in South London, it's pouring with rain at the moment. I hope it's a little bit better where you are, but looking at the forecast, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, Deborah, one of our trustees, says it's raining in West London as well. So not only are you getting a talk about Fleet Air Arm in the Battle of Britain, you're getting a nationwide weather forecast as well. And in Hampshire. Thanks, Paul. We've got a couple of minutes to go and then we'll uh, we'll start. Just while everybody's on, for those of you who have been following us through on this series all the way through, um, we've got two more coming up. Uh, unfortunately, the last uh, webinar, the April one, is going to be changed because sadly Melanie, Melanie can't do it. Um, so uh, Paul will know uh, who I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, Patrick Tuchel is actually going to do a wander through his logbook, which... Uh, I think uh, will be very interesting. Oh, I see Jules has just come on, our site manager down at uh, Keppel, and he said it's blowing a gale down there as well. I think that's what he meant by windy. Um, but uh, yeah, the weather seems to be nationwide. So uh, thanks for all you weather reporters. We'll give it one more minute and uh, there we are. Just to remind everybody, the question and answer session at the end will take questions, uh, but you can type the questions in during the uh, the piece um, by using the Q&A button. Um, I've been asked about what the dates are for the next meetings already. So I can actually tell you that, that the Christopher Joel will be talking on the 24th of March and Patrick will be talking on April the 14th, both at three o'clock. So there you are, straight away, question answered. Um, joining instructions will be published uh, through uh, social media and the website and there are the time on both of those. So here we are with now got 130 of you with us. We are expecting a few more, so we will give it 30 seconds more and then we will head away. Um, we do get a bit of drop out on some of these, but uh, we will be running there. So if I could welcome Paul Beaver to the webinar and thank him very much for offering to give this uh, talk for us. Um, 
Paul will be familiar to a lot of people. He's a well-known author, broadcaster, historian, trustees of, trustee of various uh, museums and the like. And um, last year, oh, two years ago it was, sorry, um, he wrote a book about the uh, Fleet Air Arm participation in the Battle of Britain, um, mainly in in support of the Navy Wings uh, group at Yeovilton, used to be known as the Royal Navy Historic Flight. Um, and we were very pleased to help him out on that in a small way. So um, we're very pleased that he's been able to join us today. His connections with the, uh, the Battle of Britain are, are varied and wide and uh, not least is his is, uh, connection with the Spitfire Society, of, of which he's a vice president. He also flies a Spitfire, of which I'm very jealous. So with that, we'll get the technology underway and I'll hand over to Paul for what I'm sure will be a very, very interesting talk. Over to you, Paul. Andy, thanks very much indeed. Welcome everybody. Yeah, it's pretty uh, drizzly down here in, uh, in Hampshire. The wind is 200, 22 knots, gusting 25. Um, it's 3000 meters in drizzle. Um, so certainly a day to be watching um, a webinar and not to be out flying. Um, I want to talk to you about um, the naval few. I want to talk to you about pilots um, in the Battle of Britain who wore the dark blue uniform of the Royal Navy because they're rather forgotten. Um, they are one of those groups that for years nobody has really known very much about. In fact, for 25 years, uh, the Admiralty uh, and the Air Ministry almost conspired not to admit to having them. And the reason that I wrote this um, book was because somebody had said to me in the, uh, in the Ministry of Defence, in what we might call Royal Air Force PR, uh, that there were no naval pilots in the Battle of Britain. So I decided I needed to find out more and prove him wrong. And in fact, of course, there were 57. But let's look actually at, uh, uh, at what's going on in, uh, in the world. If I can get this to move forward, it will be good. Um, but I can't at the moment. So that's why is this not doing what I you want. You need to share your screen, Paul. I haven't shared my screen. That's why, boys and girls. Um, that's because I'm rather silly. Here we go. Have you got that now? Yeah, we're all, all up now, thanks. Perfect, thank you. Um, so here we have um, two likely looking lads um, in this picture, um, sub-lieutenants and regular Navy sub-lieutenants, but both aviators, Dickie Cork and uh, somebody called Admiral, is bound to have been called Admiral, isn't he? Gardner, number 242 Squadron Dispersal, REF Coltishaw. Um, but let's uh, let's get let going again. I'm sorry, I'm being particularly dim at the moment and not being able to get this to move forward. Is it because I'm not sharing the the screen properly? Let's have a look and see if that's something that. And are you getting the right picture where you are? And you're on mute. Sorry, me being silly. Yeah, I've got the right picture and I can see your cursor moving around the screen. So. Oh, there we go. It's because I pressed the wrong button. It's it's technology. Um, let's just very quickly look at the fleet arm and the timelines. So the 24th of May 1939, um, control of the fleet air arm, as it's then called, um, is passed across to the Admiralty. It was called the fleet arm of the Royal Air Force, um, and it was made up of a mixture of naval officers and Royal Air Force officers. Um, and in May 1939, you had the choice of uh, which uniform you wanted to wear in the future. And of course, on the 3rd of September 1939, Britain goes to war with Germany. Um, and then there's a problem. Naval aviation doesn't have a budget. It doesn't have an equipment plan. And it has very few supporters in the Admiralty. Uh, the reason it was put across uh, to the Admiralty um, is all to do with the, uh, the Inchscape Committee of 1937, which we could look at in great detail, I'm sure it's a PhD somewhere, um, but it basically is saying, um, if you want to fly off ships, it's better to have naval officers to do it because um, it's an extension of the ship's weapon system um, and it's not an air force role. Um, so it's out of the frying pan 
uh, into the fire. And yet there really isn't any great plan for it. However, almost immediately, the fleet air arm are in there at the deep end. So you get the first um, of the Allied aces. Um, Bill Lucy, um, a name that it should trip off the tongue of every naval aviator, but doesn't. Um, in the Norway campaign in April 1940, he becomes a, an ace. Um, and he is busily involved flying the skewer. Now, the skewer is not a fighter. It's designed as a dive bomber. Uh, the pictures here, I think that's 803 squadron. I know certainly that the aircraft closest to us, um, uh, G for, for George, um, is being flown by the then squadron commander, um, a guy by the name of Dennis Farquharson Campbell, who goes on to be the first captain of Ark Royal 4 and the man who invented the angle flight, uh, flight deck. So we're talking of a steeped uh, naval aviator. Uh, main April, of course, is before um, France and Luxembourg and Liechtenstein and Belgium and uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, are invaded um, and before the war has really properly started, the British would say. But it doesn't take long before the British Army, British Expeditionary Force needs to be evacuated from Dunkirk. Fighter Command is overwhelmed and it welcomes the help of uh, the Royal Navy and aircraft fly from uh, coastal command stations in Kent uh, over the beaches, even aircraft as, uh, uh, as um, redundant, you might say, as the twin gun or the four gun turreted fighter uh, that's based on the, the, uh, uh, the skew of the Roque. So here we have Fall of France. Um, the Fleet Arm is still operating biplane um, fighters like the Osprey um, in 1940, not in the British theatre, but around the world. Um, what does it have available to fighter command? It's got 31 shore-based uh, skewer dive bombers, which do have forward firing machine guns. But by this time, it's starting to lose its aircraft carriers. So its aircraft, when they're available, are on shore. And the skewer, of course, is an aircraft which the fleet air arm still have great reverence for. Um, it's the first naval aircraft with a retractable gear. It's the first one of all metal construction and it has the first enclosed uh, cockpit. And surprisingly, it turns out to be a good fighter. Um, uh, those of you who will know of uh, Eric Winkle Brown will know that he um, uh, flew the skewer. Um, he practiced dive bombing in one uh, before actually going on a live raid to Normandy, uh, sorry, to Norway um, uh, in the aircraft and managed to outmaneuver BF-109 uh, on the way out from the target. So it is an aircraft of versatility. It's ruggedly built and actually um, it functions very well indeed. However, what we always have to remember is that the enemy has a vote. Italy declares war on Britain in June 1940, thinking, of course, it can mop up from the when Britain is invaded by Germany and surrenders, it will be able to take uh, Gibraltar and Malta and Cyprus and uh, and probably had Egypt and um, Mussolini's dreaming of having an Italian lake. So I thought it was worth just looking um, at where the uh, fleet air arm was uh, at this time. So this is June 1940, and the three main fighter aircraft available um, are the Skewer, which has been in service and demonstrated its capabilities, um, combat speed, miles an hour at sea level 225, the Sea Gladiator, which is a lot heavier than the RAF Gladiator because it has an arrestor hook and it has latches on it for the accelerator on the flight deck, at 209 miles an hour, and the aircraft just entering service is the new fighter, the Fulmar, um, at uh, 230 miles an hour. And like all naval aircraft, it has an observer on board, a navigator in RAF speak, because it flies over water and there is considered by the Admiralty to be a need for that. My apologies, that's really bad form. How bad is that? Sorry about that. Um, but however, what's the enemy got? Well, the enemy's got the CR-42, which you can see there, 
which is a fire, faster aircraft in the same flying conditions, sea level, ISA plus 10. So if you're going to do apples and apples, you need to have the, the speeds sorted out. That's why the BF 109 is only given 209, uh, 290 miles an hour because it's at sea level, but it does equate exactly um, to where the Brits are. But even the JU 88H, which is the fighter version, the long range fighter version, uh, has got two, two, three miles an hour as its uh, combat speed at sea level. So naval aircraft are actually not doing that well. However, that doesn't deter the Navy. Um, fear God, honor the King. The other aircraft which is available is the Blackburn Roke. Now I rather like the look of this aeroplane. I think it would be pretty much the number one candidate for the ugliest aircraft of the Second World War, but we could debate that at, at length. It's a turret fighter. It comes from the same thinking as, uh, as developed um, the Defiant, and that is that this is a bomber destroyer, so that it would fly alongside uh, enemy bombers and shoot them down by using the four machine guns in the turret. This is not designed as a fighter on fighter, and just as the Hurricane and the Spitfire are actually not originally specified to be dogfighting fighters. Um, there are 10 available um, in the front line, and one actually um, flown by a Royal Marine pilot does achieve um, a victory and uh, shoots down a bomber. I think it was a Heinkel uh, 111 over Dunkirk. But actually, by the third month of the Battle of Britain, um, it's very clear uh, that these aircraft even in home defense, are not doing, uh, not doing a good role. Um, and as a matter of interest for our spotters out there, note the difference in the, uh, in the fuselage roundel uh, there, um, a little aberration which goes back to uh, uh, the nearest aircraft painted as if it was in the Royal Naval Air Service of the, uh, the First World War. Um, what else is there? Well, in June 1940, there are 18 Gloucester Sea Gladiators available to the front line. There are further three that are based in Malta. Uh, they are the, um, what are called the fleet replacements for HMS Glorious, by which time ha has, uh, this time has been sunk. So there are three um, in uh, uh, a storage compartment at Halfar. And these, of course, come out um, and create um, uh, hope, faith, and charity for the defense of, uh, of Malta. Sea gladiators flown by, Navy, by RAF pilots um, ha with having had all of the naval equipment taken off to make them lighter. Again, by September, attrition's kicked in, mainly accidents, aircraft not shot down, um, and there are 15 left uh, in September. This is not looking like a large force. This is not looking like the hundreds of aircraft that the Luftwaffe have or the Italians have. Um, or the Royal Air Force has. So within a month of that, July 1940, the new naval fighter has arrived, the Fulmar, the 1st Squadron 808 forms up at RAF Worthy Down, just north of Winchester. Um, it's an aircraft that's been ordered off the drawing board. Um, and the 242 combat speed and the, the 680 uh, nautical mile range means it's very much a fleet fighter designed to operate off aircraft carriers and protect the fleet by intercepting the enemy, particularly torpedo bombers at range. Now there are eight aircraft immediately available and by uh, September, uh, 30 have been delivered uh, initially uh, to RAF Worthy Down where the squadron has formed, but it's gonna move north. But the most precious resource that the fleet air arm can offer Royal Air Force Fighter Command are its pilots. What can it offer to deliver the to save the nation? Well, actually, some of the best trained pilots in the world. The reason for that is they've gone through the British training system, which in 1940, before the Battle of Britain, is the envy of the world. This is a well thought out, well practiced uh, system of having basic and elementary and uh, advanced and operational flying training through a range of aircraft. So the pilots that come out are resourceful, they're well trained, and they have a number um, of particular skills. And here are two of them. You saw them earlier. 
Sub-Lieutenant Cork and Sub-Lieutenant Gardner, and they're with number 242 Squadron uh, at RAF Coltishaw. I'm going to come back to Dickie Cork later because he is one of my great heroes. Um, uh, he didn't, of course, survive the war. Uh, most naval aviators who joined at the very beginning didn't survive the Second World War. It was a high attrition rate, higher than that of Bomber Command, and it was a pretty perilous place to be, not just for the regulars, but for those of the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve um, who joined uh, later in 1940. Uh, people like Eric Winkle Brown, who first joined the Royal, uh, the Royal Navy in the Volunteer Reserve. Pilot training gets into top gear in 1940, but there are still not enough fighter pilots. Here, for example, is number seven, uh, OTU at Hull Warden. That's the Airbus factory now up uh, in, I think it's uh, just in Wales, uh, in June 1940. Look at the number of dark blue uniforms. Note also, uh, right in the center is a naval midshipman. So this is the lowest of the low. Midshipmen are neither um, uh, uh, foul nor, uh, uh, nor, nor, nor bird. They are, they are, uh, uh, they're not really officers and they're not really um, um, uh, ratings, but they're there flying. And if you look at the, uh, the wings on the sleeves, you can see that these pilots are all qualified. Um, and the one on the extreme uh, left is wearing the wavy Navy, Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve um, uh, rank insignia. Uh, his next door neighbor is a regular and another regular next to him. But the poor Middy, of course, just has white flashes on his collar um, to show that uh, uh, his rank. I think that's a really, really instructive uh, picture because it has some fascinating people there. There's a second midshipman um, in the back row, a third from the right. Now, by August 1940, what has the fleet arm offered? 57 trained fighter pilots. Only Canada, Poland, New Zealand, and Czechoslovakia have offered more. Um, 23 of the 57 pilots are immediately loaned uh, to fighter command, um, mainly flying hurricanes, but also flying Spitfires. Uh, the others, of course, are manning naval air uh, squadrons, two naval air squadrons, and I'll come on to those uh, in a minute. But of course, it's not just fighter pilots that's needed. It's the people who can look after the airplanes. And you also need the naval ratings. And there's Jack Tar running um, to, uh, to Hurricanes. Um, I would imagine that's a publicity photograph. Uh, but even so, um, I love the picture because it demonstrates the naval pilots there and naval ratings all supporting in the defense of Great Britain. The Battle of Britain, as people have heard me say before, is absolutely the result. The victory there is absolutely as a result of the whole nation pulling together, whether well, your Navy, Army, Air Force, civilian, military, you're working in a factory, you're a baker, you're a GPO linesman, it's a whole nation effort. And that is really important. However, in July 1940, the Battle of Britain is deemed to have start on the 10th of July. Nobody's actually thought about the air defense of the home fleet. Uh, here's HMS Hood in Scarpa Flow with the home fleet. That's a big target. If you, if you were a German bomber, that's wonderful. That's a huge amount of capability there that you can cause damage to. The Royal Air Force doesn't have sufficient fighters to stretch all the way up to Scarpa Flow, which is on Orkney. So the Navy has to step in. And this is one of, coming now, it's one of my favorite photographs of the period. 804 Squadron at Hatston um, with their sea gladiators. You can see um, on the right of the aircraft, there's the, the arrestor hook. Um, uh, on that sea gladiator. There's a brilliant piece of cockpit art there, um, which is uh, rather derogatory about um, uh, the Nazis with uh, um, a lieutenant, Royal Navy lieutenant's uh, arm in the picture. And there are 
four pilots here that are identifiable. Um, they are, all four of them, go on to fly um, through the war. Uh, Jimmy Say um, uh, in the, on the cockpit sill there with in a rather striking pose, survives the war. Shi uh, Pi Lan, uh, directly in front of him, uh, doesn't. He was Winkle's element commander um, in the Battle of the Atlantic flying from uh, HMS Audacity. Uh, there's Brian Patterson, who also survives the war. I think he didn't die until about 20 years ago um, in his shirt sleeves there with hands in his pockets. And then there's Pat Patterson, Norris Patterson, who was lost in 1941 when HMS uh, Audacity uh, it sunk um, in the, the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, and it was really good because of my help from both the Battle of Britain Memorial um, on the uh, on the embankment and uh, the Memorial Trust um, and friends um, in the fleet era, I was able to identify all the people. So my book, um, Forgotten Few, um, which is actually um, available from the Memorial Trust or from Navy Wings or from the Spitfire Society, um, uh, identifies all of these people. And they are great characters. They are amazing characters. Um, some of the pilots who flew with 808 Squadron, for example, which has been formed at RAF Castletown. RAF uh, Castletown is just on the tip, it's just slightly north of Wick, it's pointing out into the North Sea. It's a big field more than uh, being an airfield. Um, and uh, it's declared operational on the 8th of September, has moved north. And this is a picture of the four miles uh, flying up uh, in formation. Uh, they're being led by the Coburn Port Air. Um, so I would imagine that squadron was pretty well uh, catered for and uh, mess dinners. Um, but there are lots of other interesting people. There were heirs to breweries. There's the heir to the Yardley perfume um, uh, conglomerate. All of them are members um, of the Fleet Air Arm. So we've got then to into September, we know now that there are two naval air squadrons in the order of battle um, of RAF Fighter Command. But there are also the pilots, the 23 pilots that I mentioned earlier. And where are they? And who are they flying with? Well, on Hurricanes, they're on the following squadrons, 46, 79, 111, 151, 219, 242, 245, and 263. Um, this is a picture of the dispersal of uh, of Triple One, um, and there's a brilliant um, tale I've recounted in the book of uh, the two pilots who are uh, allocated two sub lieutenants allocated Triple One Squadron. Uh, they're up at Aberdeen. Um, they're given the night duties because well they're Navy, um, and they're not night qualified. They can't even technically fly at night, and the telephone rings and the ops center is saying scramble and they're going uh, can't scramble not night qualified no 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 you didn't hear me scramble aircraft um uh, our uh, german aircraft sighted you know bandits coming in etc so they get airborne uh, and they go chasing around um scotland in the dark and manage to land back on having frightened the german bombers away and they resolve not to tell their raf bosses that they went flying that night until the telephone rings that morning and its group congratulating them and complimenting them on a brilliant operation to frighten away the German bombers. I, it's one of those things that's not in, a, in an ORB, it only comes out when you read people's diaries, which is the wonderful thing that all these people, I'm delighted to say, kept diaries and they're kept by their, uh, their sons and daughters, some of whom I hope are watching uh, this presentation. I'd like to say thank you for letting me into your family secrets. But let's talk about a Hurricane pilot that I have huge, huge admiration for, Dickie Cork. So he's Bader's wingman in 242 Squadron, cultural. And he's shot down by 15th of September. Um, he, he's doing a lot. I mean, he could have become an ace in a day. He shoots down five aircraft on the 15th of September. He's already plowed into 110s and, uh, and Heinkels. Um, and he is the archetypal 
Navy test pilot, uh, sorry, fighter pilot. He is understated, um, quite modest, quite reserved, deadly in what he does. And what I think is, is absolute testament to this is what Douglas Bader says of him. He puts in his report when he leaves 242 to go back to the fleet, I want to keep him as a flight commander. He rates him exceptional. Now, those of us who fly dream of being rated exceptional. He also endorses uh, Dickey's logbook and says, this man has courage and leadership. And actually, Dickey Court goes on to command the squadron um, and goes on to fly in the Mediterranean and increase the number of enemy aircraft that he shoots down. He does an amazingly good job. But what about another Admiral? Sub-Lieutenant Arthur Blake, also called Admiral, of course, because everybody is, if you're a, a naval officer and uh, on a, um, uh, a Royal Air Force squadron. Uh, fleet Iron Pilots are with 1964, 70, uh, 40, uh, 74 and 266. These are leading squadrons. These are, these are high scoring squadrons. Um, so uh, Blake joins 19 squadron at Duxford and has a DFC, but he's killed in a dogfight over the Thames Estuary on the 2nd of November. Technically, I know after the Battle of Britain um, has finished, but just to show you um, how tough the Battle of Britain was. Um, uh, another young man, and we know a lot about them because of the, uh, of the work of the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust, uh, but worth remembering. Uh, there were naval pilots who flew, fought, and died as well. The nine lost their lives in the Battle of Britain. And another naval pilot, although a Royal Marine, the only Royal Marines ace, and one who I had the pleasure of knowing because I live in, uh, in Hampshire, and he lived just over the border um, in Amesbury in Wiltshire in his later life. Um, he enjoyed flying with fleet arms so much, he actually transferred to the Royal Navy in 1951 and went to the Korean War. Um, but he uh, shot down um, the first, uh, or the only aircraft ever shot down, I believe, by Roke, um, or Rock, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, over Dunkirk. But he'd fought uh, in Norway, and he fought, he flew sea fires over Tokyo, um, an amazing character. Uh, and one, again, that the Royal Marines and the Royal Navy perhaps don't take enough notice of. And so fitting that we should remember him, uh, in, I think, in this talk. Now, what other aircraft did the Navy have? Well, what's to me absolutely fascinating is the first martlets had been delivered um, to the Royal Navy in October 1940. Um, Americans will know these, of course, as Wildcats. There were six available and flying with 804 Squadron. Uh, they didn't actually see uh, enemy action, but they were available. And they're painted in this amazing gloss color because this is what the Americans at the Grumman factory thought that everyone was flying around in because they weren't at war in, German, uh, in uh, America. So all their airplanes were nice and shiny. And you'll notice the rudder on this aircraft um, is actually painted um, in the French uh, style because these aircraft were originally going to the, uh, the French Air Force or to the Aero Naval, depending on uh, which batch. We got them for free. Uh, initially, they came with metric uh, instruments and they came, interestingly, uh, without shoulder straps. So the strap you can see there uh, on the pilot in the cockpit, if you look carefully, is actually just his parachute. Um, and Winkle Brown, I, I talk a lot about Winkle Brown, but, uh, I have huge affection for, for Winkle. Um, he broke his nose um, uh, on a, a, a rough landing in a martlet when uh, he went forward because there was no shoulder straps uh, and hit his nose um, on the reflector gun sight. And there's a long story about what happens uh, when he gets the, uh, the shoulder straps fitted. So some takeaways for you, because we're getting towards the end of, of uh, of my formal presentation before we go into questions. Um, things I'd like you to remember. The first British ace was Fleet Air Arm, that Royal Marines flew in the Battle of Britain, that petty officers flew in the Battle of Britain, uh, and that the Air Ministry suppressed the naval few until 1960. 
And amazingly, the Admiralty didn't object. I find that just ridiculous. When today we have operating, and I'm sure they will be even this weather, um, F-35s of 617 Squadron that are commanded by naval officer uh, with mixed Navy and, uh, and Royal Air Force crews operating off Queen Elizabeth. Um, in, they are working together seamlessly and they will go off on a, on a carrier strike deployment. Um, it seems bizarre uh, that uh, 60, 70 years ago, there wasn't this acknowledgement. And in fact, even recently, as I said it right at the beginning, I was told by the, by the Royal Air Force that no, nobody in the Navy flew um, in, uh, in the Battle of Britain. Um, the other thing please to remember is that nine pilots died uh, they are remembered at Capel. They are remembered at the London um, uh, Embankment. And I, I put here in July 2021, 20, actually, I found out today it won't be because of COVID. We are going to have a formal uh, remembrance of them at the memorial with a cricket match in Chelsea. We thought a cricket match would be appropriate for, for these young men. Uh, that's now been postponed, um, but we will be telling people um, when that's, uh, that's going to happen. Um, the, to me, this is um, uh, as important um, as anybody else. Remember uh, that there were, this is the fifth largest contribution of non Royal Air Force Fighter Command aircrew uh, in the Battle of Britain. If you want to know more, if you want to know that the brilliant, brilliant histories of these guys and their biographies, some are disappointingly short because, of course, they didn't last very long. Some, however, did and managed to still cram in a huge uh, life, then please um, go to my book, which is uh, uh, On the Forgotten Few. It's available from the, the uh, Memorial Trust um, and it's online. Um, and uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Um, to me, um, what's key about it is that I've been able to update the biographies that you find um, elsewhere by going and looking at people's logbooks and diaries. And thank you again to the families of uh, the forgotten few, the naval fighter pilots of the Battle of Britain who helped me. So with that, I'm very happy to take, uh, to take questions. I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening um, to this little known part of the Battle of Britain. Over to you, Andy. Okay, well, thanks very much, Paul. Um... Just to uh, reiterate what Paul said about his book, if you uh, it's it's slightly different to the uh, the previous purchases through the trust. If you use our inquiries at battleofbritainmemorial.org um, to order them, uh, we'll ensure that you get them. The reason is that we've got a limited supply in the on the e-shop at the moment, but uh, Paul will be able to supply via us. So. Uh, go to the inquiry. Very happy to do that, Andy. I can do however you want to do it. Yeah. So if you go to the inquiries at uh, battleofbritain.org, you can see it there. Um, we've got some questions coming in for you at the moment. Um, so Andy, do you want to, uh, if you'd like to give me the questions, I'll try and give you yeah, the answer. I will do that for you, Paul. Um, somebody uh, from Mark Perry here. Uh, could you expand on your comment about the Hurricane and the Spitfire not being designed for dogfighting? Is this a reference to the highly current uh, choreographical uh, area tax doctrine on bombers or something more fundamental? Oh, a, a very good question. Thank you. I mean, this isn't really a Spitfire and Hurricane uh, presentation, but if you look at the specification um, for both aircraft, you'll see that it doesn't, uh, in the key user requirements, uh, it talks about um, time to height, it talks about speed, it talks about armament, um, it talks about endurance, and it talks about um, its ability um, to engage bomber formations. Because if you think of the 1930s, um, the, the enemy by then was Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany was um, some several hundred miles away from the British coast. Um, so there weren't going to be fighter escorts, um, certainly not single seat um, fighter escorts coming with German bombers. So it was a bomber versus, uh, fighter versus bomber idea. And it was absolutely the doctrine of the area defense. Um, you know, France wasn't going to fall. France had the largest air force in the world um, in 1940. Of course, it wasn't going to fall. It had the largest army, had the second largest navy. 
Um, so, you know, it, there was no way that that was going to, uh, that they were going to fall. Um, so the whole doctrine had been designed um, a, to fight bombers and to climb above the bombers and to engage the bombers. Um, we could go into more detail, but uh, uh, perhaps that's a, a lecture for another time. Okay, thanks. Uh, this one's from Chris Palmer, who I suspect might know you, Paul, from his comment. Uh, great talk. Good to see your technical ability has not improved. Uh, and his question is, when did the Admiralty start believing in the fleet air arm? Well, Commodore Palmer is, is, a, is a great naval uh, aviator and, uh, and um, uh, was, uh, was boss at, uh, at Yerbleton. Um, I'm not sure that, that the Admiralty ever really um, forgave the fleet air arm for, um, for the aircraft carriers, because certainly the Admiralty, and we're talking about the pre-1965 when the Ministry of Defence was created, it's a totally different um, uh, entity. But the Admiralty still believed in the, the late 1940s that the battleship was the capital ship. It didn't quite grasp the fact the aircraft carrier was temporarily before the submarine was going to take uh, take its place. Um, but if you look at the careers of fleet air arm officers, um, and it might still uh, apply today, um, the fleet air arm is considered to be just a little bit uh, gauche. It's considered to be um, uh, just something that um, it's not quite right that you want to go flying, because if you uh, if you want to be a naval officer, you have to be a principal warfare officer and be locked up in the ops room and uh, and and doing that. So um, this is scurrilous stuff, of course. Um, but um, certainly, um, to, from my personal side, I went to Dartmouth in 1975 to be a naval aviator. They didn't want naval aviators, and they wanted me instead to be a submariner. I chose the option that I had of leaving and not continuing my naval career. And so probationary temporary acting sub-Lieutenant Beaver, um, this became Mr. Beaver again. Um, uh, and I felt that that was uh, uh, pretty symptomatic that you know, this was the time, 75, it's when the submarines are in the ascendancy. Of course, you, if you wanted a career in the Navy, Paul, and be an Admiral, you wanted to be a submariner. Um, very few uh, uh, naval aviators have ever uh, reached the top, stand fast, George Sandellas and a few others, of course. Okay, thanks. Uh, question from Richard McCauley. Uh, are any naval aviators who took part in the Battle of Britain decorated? Well, I know, I know for certain that quite a number got DFM and DFC, but um... they they did indeed, um, uh, and and that's the uh, uh, that's the award. They were uh, they were pretty junior people. Remember, they were sub lieutenants. Um, five five victories, um, the Distinguished Flying Cross, um, and I believe one of the petty officers that got the Distinguished Flying Medal. Uh, why you had to differentiate with a medal for um, a, a, a rating as opposed to a cross for an officer. Uh, of course, that was all addressed in 1993, and now uh, the award is the same. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, we're in the same as, as junior pilots on a fighter squadron uh, here in the Royal Air Force. So it's the, it's the DFC mainly. Um, and if they achieved the requisite number of victories, uh, they got the DFC. Uh, others went on, of course, in, that, in their careers after the Battle of Britain um, to win DSOs um, and uh, uh, even some Air Force crosses for gallantry, uh, not in the face of the enemy. Thanks. Uh, question from Ian. Um, with your Spitfire knowledge, do you know how many sea fires that might one day become airworthy? Cool. Wow. Um, that's one I wasn't expecting. So uh, um, there are two sea fires in rebuild at the moment. There's one sea fire uh, up for sale. Um, so I think that's the three that I know of. Um, I can't think of any more, Ian, um, three. I would be lucky to get more than that, um, I would have thought. Uh, the sea fire is a very rare bird. Perhaps somebody else knows and, uh, and uh, can give us a quick message now. But I think there's a, uh, the, some late models, some 17s. Uh, and of course, there is the, the three that was flying until the end of a season 2019. You may have seen there was a, a story about it possibly being sold in America uh, in the Daily Mail some two or three weeks ago. 
Thanks. Uh, from Tim Clark, what were the difference, main differences in training between the Fleet Air Arm and the RAF fighter pilots during the Battle of Britain? Oh, that's that's a, a very interesting question, actually, and a very good question, because um, the Navy uh, fighter pilots trained for slightly longer because they needed better navigational skills. Um, if you're going to be flying over water, your dead reckoning has to be um, particularly good. And right at the beginning, in 39, when uh, they were first training before we got into the the rush to get people into cockpits. Um, there was a lot of work being done on dive bombing, for example. So a naval fighter pilot is a naval pilot. So he's an all rounder. He can dive bomb or toss bomb or level bomb. Um, he can navigate and he can air, air fight as well, dog fight as well. So if you like, the training is broader. So people like Dickie Cork or uh, um, uh, Arthur Blake and uh, uh, who are on that, that last picture uh, of mine, uh, though they definitely were a, a more rounded and broader um, uh, aviator than the standard Royal Air Force fighter pilot or bomber pilot or coaster clown who were streamed much earlier. There's a couple of nice comments from Tracy and Wayne Cochran thanking you for the presentation and saying Thank goodbye you. the book. Uh, Mary Slay is asking about the curious emblem on the fuselage of the picture of 802 mm. squadron that that yeah. is, is, is wonderful isn't it it really is a lovely uh, a lovely marking it appears to be um uh in some, it's it's definitely the arm of a naval aviator because you've got the the two uh, gold bars of a lieutenant you've got the curl to show that uh, it's an officer in a monarchy and then you've got um the the wings uh, the um uh, the fleet are on where their wings on their um, sanded dress um, are on their uh, on their sleeves. Um, and you've got what appears to be, um, it's a fascist symbol, and it appears to be being pushed down. It's a little bit like the, the, uh, the symbols that, uh, for example, Douglas Bader had on his hurricane, which is uh, Hitler being kicked up the backside. Um, it's, it's a similar, in that sort of vein. Um, uh, it, it's obviously somewhere we need a bit more research. What I, what I love about um, this, this, the Fleet Arm is a very small organization in 1940, um, but it's already got its own character. It's already got its own, um, its own traditions. Um, it, it's making its own culture. Um, it's, a, it's not the Royal Air Force culture. It's not the Royal Navy culture. It's the Fleet Air Arm culture. And actually you have to say it's always been thus. Uh, Mark Perry's thanking you. Uh, then we go into uh, a question from Ghost in Two, uh, obviously uh, a pseudonym. Um, did naval aviators from other nations also fly and fight in the Battle of Britain, e.g., the French? Uh, no, there are no other naval aviators that I've managed to find. I'm, I'm not sure if if, uh, uh, if somebody knows better than me. Um, there would only have been the Aero Naval that uh, would have had. Um, naval aviators, Poland, for example, and the Czechs didn't. Um, and in those days, there was no Royal New Zealand Navy that wasn't formed until 1941. There was the Royal Australian Navy, but I don't believe any of their pilots um, came to the Battle of Britain. So no, I think it's just, just the Royal Navy, the only ones uh, I know of. Later, there were some Dutch naval aviators um, but they, of course, were flying with the Royal Navy. Um, uh, they had brought their uh, Dornier um, uh, flying boats uh, across, um, and they flew uh, out of Malta, um, for example. Uh, and there were some Norwegian naval pilots as well who did the same, but they came after the Battle of Britain and they were flying, uh, flying boats. Um, Norway at that time had no air force. It didn't have an air force until the end of the Second World War. Um, it had a, an army aviation and it had a naval aviation, as so many countries did. Uh, comment from one of your acquaintances, I believe, from Tim McMahon, just saying that as a footnote rather than a question, midshipmen, um, including himself, were sporting wings well into the 60s and probably well beyond. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, Tim. Um, uh, it, those were the days um, when certainly into the 60s and into the 70s, uh, middies had uh, wings because uh, they had joined straight from school um, and they'd gone through the flying training. It was in the days when flying training worked before we had 
the system we've got today where people spend two and a half years, three years waiting, uh, what's called holding. Um, in, uh, in the 60s and 70s, when the services had control of their own flying training, um, the system worked uh, and people went straight, um, got wings and went straight flying. Um, but yes, absolutely. Today, I think there are fewer midshipmen. That's probably why more people are joining with, uh, uh, with degrees. And I think I'm right in saying um, they are commissioned uh, almost immediately. So that, that's, that's really the difference. But a useful thing to remember. Thank you, Tim. And uh, I hope you're staying safe. Yeah, I think they, that the same thing happened in the Air Force when the Master, Master Air Crew badge went, didn't it? Indeed. I mean, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the integrated review next week will tell us there are going to be more changes. And what are we talking about in Air Force that by 2040 will be 90% flown uh, remotely. Um, so there'll be fewer and fewer people who sport wings. I mean, I'm very proud of my army wings, um, which um, as a reservist aviator in the, or reservist rather in the Royal Auxiliary Air Force, um, 601 squadron, I still wear army wings on my Air Force uniform, um, which is a, a huge um, pr a pleasure and privilege. Well, uh, another question from Richard McCauley. Um, did any of the fleet air on pilots remain in RAF squadrons after the end of the battle? Uh, no, Richard, they, um, uh, they all went back to the fleet air arm. Um, some took longer uh, to go back, some were held in, uh, until the end of 1940. Um, but the, the fleet air arm was busily building up uh, its fighter strength, having lost aircraft carriers in 1939 and 1940. Um, it was busily re-equipping mainly with the Fulmar, um, but also with American aircraft like the Martlet, um, and later, of course, um, uh, sea fires were coming into service. So, uh, no, but I think the, the training uh, that um, uh, of being in the Battle of Britain and working alongside the Royal Air Force, it must have been an, a, a really good training, operational training experience, because if you look at the careers um, of the pilots that, uh, that served with our air squadrons, the 23 who served and went on to fly um, back in the fleet air arm, I think almost all of them commanded squadrons um, and almost all of them became uh, wing leaders. Um, so they all had illustrious careers after the time of the Battle of Britain. I think it, the Battle of Britain, like it was for the Royal Air Force, was a really important um, sort of foundation to air fighting. Um, talking of martlets, a uh, question from Mark C saying, is, is the mart martlet that's in the Fleet Air Arm Museum at Yeovilton one of the French orders, and was it used in the battle? Uh, I think I'm right in saying it's a Mark IV, and it was one that was ordered by the British Purch Purchasing uh, Commission uh, in 19, uh, 1939 stroke 1940 from Grumman. Um, and it's one, by the time it arrived, it had been called a martlet. We, we had this ridiculous idea that we would have uh, American airplanes and we key that call them by uh, British names. So the Avenger was the tarpon initially and the, and the wildcat was the martlet and just confused everybody. It still confuses people um, today. But no, it, it wasn't the Battle of Britain aircraft. I think it was a fleet fighter from later uh, in the war. There are no Mark 1s, 2s and 3s in existence, I don't think. Um, and these, the early aircraft, I mean, Winkle called them really robust. Little a little buzzing bees, but as but as strong as a bumblebee. I mean, he thought that the martlet. He put a martlet down on a carrier when its deck was uh, was moving thirty feet out of the vertical, um, and still took the wire. Uh, and he was wounded at the time. Um, and uh, the aircraft was usable um, the, afterwards, within hours of being refueled and rearmed. So. Um, the Martlet is a it, wildcat. Um, was a, a, a phenomenally high, uh, aircraft. I think there's a, a wildcat, American wildcat, being restored at the moment in Britain, which we hope will be around in not this season but the next season. Um, so I love seeing them. They're great looking airplane. Uh, another one from Chris Penny. How did the Royal Marines come to be serving in aviation? Well, did you know that, that Winston Churchill's uh, instructor pilot was a Royal Marine? 
Major Lushington, um, and um, he's the reason that, we, that uh, the Prime Minister, uh, the then actually who was then, what was he then, uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, didn't get his wings, was because the morning he was going to go solo, go solo um, Major Lushington uh, died um, uh, when he crashed the aircraft um, uh, flying into East Church to uh, take uh, Winston Churchill for his solo. Um, uh, it was, um, it was, and it still is, an option for Royal Marines um, to fly. Um, there were Royal Marines flying, um, of course, in uh, uh, in the Falklands War, and today, eight four five, uh, eight four seven, Naval Air Squadron um, is uh, a Marine squadron, uh, and there are pilots flying Merlins, Marine pilots flying Merlins, and there are Naval officers who have done the the Royal Marine. Um, Green Berry course as well. Um, so the Royal Marines and the Royal Air Force ver uh, and the Royal Navy very much uh, linked together in this way. Uh, Dave Aero is uh, asked a question and made a comment. I'll do the comment first. Um, he's saying he found, uh, he's found a memorial to Arthur Blake in Chelmsford where he lives. Ah, um, excellent. He, uh, his aircraft came down in Chelmsford after the engagement over the Thames and he first heard about a Spitfire coming down in Chelmsford, but it took him years to find more information. So maybe there's somebody that uh, can give you how, a how interesting. I think that's you know that, that that's very much the, the the case, isn't it? You know, his this is this is not um, sort of what you expect. You wouldn't be going out looking for a naval officer's uh, grave um, who'd been a Spitfire pilot um uh, because you just wouldn't wouldn't think it was possible but yes he must have been um, the aircraft i would imagine um uh, it was over the thames estuary in the dogfight and uh, he would have uh, the aircraft came down um uh, in essex and so yes buried there um, thank you for that that's very interesting yeah. and he, he also asked a question which was um after the battle did the surviving rn pilots return to carrier ops I think um, mm. you've probably already answered I think that. I've already answered that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Very much so. I mean, um, uh, and some land ops as well. We were flying a naval aircraft in the desert, of course. Um, uh, there were a number of fighter squadrons and Elbacore uh, uh, night bombing squadrons in the desert uh, and on Malta uh, and in Kenya and Ceylon um, all the way through. And of course, the British Pacific Fleet had a huge number of, of uh, of fighters, uh, they had fighter only carriers, um, which were a lot of them had members of the fleet air arm who'd flown the Battle of Britain as uh, as commanders. Uh, Matt Winter is asking, um, I think he's one of your acquaintances from the way he's phrased it, but uh, essentially saying, we're all 57 fleet air arm Navy pilots, British citizens, and were there any non British fleet air arm pilots flying? elsewhere during the time period, i.e. on pilot exchange programs or something. Andy, this is, uh, this is Vice Admiral Matt Winter of uh, the United States Navy, um, who uh, was the boss of the F-35 uh, program. Matt, greetings to you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, Matt is uh, one of the trustees of the Billy Fisk Foundation, Billy being the first American to die in the Battle of Britain, and of course, with 601 Squadron, um, uh, who was buried at Boxgrove uh, in Sussex. Um, but no, they were all they were all British citizens in the sense that some of them were born in the empire. Um, so if you were South African, born in South Africa, that was part of the empire. So uh, this is this um, this this probably you get about you know, Britain standing alone. Um, Britain did stand alone because New Zealand was a dominion, Australia was a dominion, Canada was a dominion, um, and so they were British. Um, but they were also Canadian or Kiwi or South African or whatever. Um, but they were, for all intents and purposes, Brits, um, and uh, they didn't wear shoulder flashes, which said any other any other nation. There was no Canada or uh, or New Zealand, and there were no Americans at this time. The Americans, of course, queuing up to try and join the Royal Air Force and pretending to be Canadians, just like Billy Fisk. Thanks for the question, Matt. Yeah, it's interesting. I was uh, at uh, the Priory. Uh, last year for Paul Funza's funeral, and of course uh, Billy Fisk's grave is there, and, a, and an excellent, excellent memorial window there as well. 
there is indeed and 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 it's uh if anyone wants to go on youtube and 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 um and to put in a billy fisk's funeral um you can see uh, the pomp and circumstance uh that was uh, was put on to remember this very brave uh man who was uh, shot down at RF Tangmere, which is just across the road from Boxgrove. Uh, Wayne Cochran's making a suggestion for you. Why don't you put your book on Kindle? Well, I'll leave that one to you. Uh, it's complex. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to try and do is put this uh, actually on, on Blurb or one of those uh, print on demand, but I've got to tell you, it's a very complex way. I'd much rather give money to uh, the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust or Navy Wings or the Spitfire Society. but. But thank you. And and hey, a book. You want to read a book? You don't want to read a tablet. I mean, good heavens. Absolutely. What next? You can't sign a tablet either. That's true. Uh, Richard McCauley's made the point that uh, some members of the Friends of the Fleet Air Arm Museum couldn't get on because we were sold out. That's because uh, it times out just before we start. Uh, but I can answer this one. It will be appearing on the Memorial Trust YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow so people that couldn't see it live today can actually see the talk and the questions tomorrow oh brilliant thank on, you on our, on our youtube channel yeah That's i'm very great. happy to do that and it, and if um if anyone in the, in the society of friends of fleet Arm museum want me to to repeat this for them in some way i'd be very happy to do it and perhaps i'll be slightly more technically competent then and commodore palmer was complimentary and give me a bravo zulu instead of uh, uh, making me buy my horse's neck right uh charlie puckett is uh thanking you for a very fascinating talk it's filled a filled a gap in his knowledge i'll forgive him for being uh, more interested in the navy than the air force but uh, we're all in the same boat we're all looking at the the same piece of history um Paul Fry in London's obviously got wind of the fact you're writing a book on Winkle Brown. Uh, mm -hmm. When's it coming out, Paul? Um, so the book is the uh, manuscripts in final edit. Um, the maps are being drawn. The photographs have been selected. Um, and it will be on the Michael Joseph imprint of uh, Penguin uh, Random House uh, the 21st of January next year, which would be, have been Winkle's 22nd birthday uh, sorry 102nd birthday um so it comes out next year so so you know, stand by if you go on amazon now i think you can order an advanced copy if you if you if you're that desperate uh dave from air has been on again he's just emailed you some photos of uh, arthur blake's memorial oh lovely thank you for that that's appreciated uh, question from Jenjib. Um, did Eugene Esmond, who was Irish, fight in the battle? Uh, no, he didn't. Um, Eugene Esmond um, was uh, a, um, a TAS pilot, a torpedo and submarine pilot, um, and he was flying at Swordfish um, at this time. He went on, of course, to command 825 Squadron and win the Victoria Cross posthumously um, in 1941 um, on, the, uh, on the Channel Dash. Um, uh, another short pilot, um, Winkle used to claim to be five foot six. According to his service record, he was five foot five and a half. Eugene Esmond was about five foot four. Um, but then again, most people were. Um, you know, this is, you know, the, the six footers or people like me over six one um, are, are, were unusual in, uh, in the uh, Second World War. Um, and um, Esmond, of course, was also called Winkle. What's interesting is that there have been two Winkles, there have been you know, Winkle Esmond and Winkle Brown, and I don't think there'll ever be a third because everybody just knows Winkle. And that just brings us to a final comment from Chris Palmer, who's just given you a bravo Zulu. Ah, excellent. Thank you, sir, so much. Appreciate that. Um, uh, I'll still perhaps buy you Perhaps you ought to explain to the non-naval people what bravo Zulu is. Um, it's it, it, flexible, it, flexible it, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's flag. It's a flag symbol. It's um, um, uh, two two flags are run up B and Z. If you've done something, a, executed a manoeuvre well, I think is is the term. Um, but it's a, it's signal flags. Most things are done in the navy still signal flags, and the navy used to communicate by using verses from the Bible, um, and and simply by saying something like Genesis three um, verse four 
um, which would say um, you are um, you are a stupid young man or something like that. I, I make that up. Um, but um, the Navy has its has its traditions, uh, and long may uh, they uh, they continue. Uh, with that, it gives me great pleasure to thank Paul for a very very interesting session, um, super talk, and the questions have been equally uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks to those of you who have asked the questions and to Paul for answering them so fully. Uh, oh, great fun, and Andy, thank you, and thank you for all the questions. It, it's good to have questions because um, no no presenter will ever cover um, uh, in an hour or less than an hour a subject completely. So I appreciate the questions and I appreciate the extra information. And if anyone wants to get in touch with me um, via the trust, um, I'd be very happy to uh, to talk further. Thank you, Andy. Thanks. Um, just to wrap it all up, um, the. Uh... Trust is uh, hoping to open the site at Capel fully, uh, if it's all in line with the government roadmap and all the rest of it, um, on May the 18th. Um, it will be open from Wednesdays till Sundays for five days from May the 18th. But watch this space, things will change, I'm sure. But that's our plan at the moment. Um, in the meantime, we still need to uh, generate cash to keep the place going. Um, on your screens at the moment, there's a some ways of, of doing that uh, through the Just Giving page. We will accept checks, we'll accept real money if we've got any. <laughs> um, and the uh, the numbers are there for the, the text giving as well. Um, the next talk is by uh, Christopher Joel, who's uh, it'll be a slightly different one for you this time. Uh, he's gonna talk about spores of war. Um, he's made a... Uh, quite a collection of uh, anecdotes and stories about th items that have come into British possession um, as a result of wars. Um, and he's, he's, he's written a book about it, which is quite fascinating. Um, Christopher is, a, is an author and a historian, but he's also the um, official archivist for the Household Cavalry. So um, it'll be a slightly different uh, tack on uh, the ones that we've had up till now. His talk is on the 24th of March. Uh, we'll look out on the social media and the website for the, um, the joining instructions. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, Melody Foreman can't do her talk on April the 14th. So uh, uh, the Trust Secretary, uh, Patrick Tootle, has stepped in and he'll be talking about his uh, significant points in his logbook. And uh, when I tell you I've seen his logbook and they're quite fascinating, uh, some of the things he's going to talk about. I'm sure you'll enjoy that. So once again, thank you very much, Paul. Um, hope to see you in, in real life down at the memorial. Look forward uh, to sometime, it. Sometime soon. <laughs> we'll be and, there in uh, the summer, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our uh, viewers and listeners. Um, and we hope to see you uh, for Christopher's talk later in the month. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.